In Thomas Pynchon's sprawling, epic, postmodern novel, Gravity's Rainbow, there's a sequence in which the main character is interrogated by the U.S. government under the influence of sodium amytal, commonly called truth serum. The writing slips into several dreamlike riffs on language. In one, a telegram from Wisconsin launches the main character into an obsessive meditation on the possible constructions of a six-word sequence. You never did the Kenosha Kid. As more and more examples are presented, each with different punctuations, we become aware of a key postmodern truth, that words can point toward reality but they can never get there. They always mean different things in different contexts. But just how many different contexts are there? Well, Pynchon only gives us seven. There are far too many punctuation marks and emphases, far too many combinations for a single writer to catalog them all. Besides, in the aesthetic universe of the novel, cataloging them all would be exhaustive and redundant. Enter the internet and a man named Darius Kazemi. Hi, everybody. He makes what he likes to call weird internet stuff. I make what I like to call weird internet stuff, which I've recently come to accept is internet art. Last year, Darius made a Twitter bot that did what the writer Thomas Pynchon can't ever do. It automatically generates a different construction of the You Never Did the Kenosha Kid sequence every two hours. Now, as of this video, the account has already tweeted 8,600 times, and with the number of permutations possible, could continue for years without exhausting every one. Go there sometime, try reading a few out loud. The effect of Pynchon's language experiment is compounded updated. The truth it wants to communicate is received in a new way. And the exhaustiveness that would have been inappropriate in a book is made novel and strangely vital in this new form. I think what this shows us is that the aesthetics of internet art, of art made with and for and on the internet, won't conform to any that we've known before. And that's fitting, because a lot of internet art is made unlike any art that came before it. Kazemi's Twitter bots aren't made with paintbrushes or musical instruments. They're made with algorithms, with code. This is what the Kenosha Kid Twitter bot really looks like. Is there any beauty in that? What about this bot? No, it's just a set of instructions. Well, here's what those instructions do. This programming, these rules, perform a simple task. They access the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and pull from the public last word statements of death row inmates any sentence that contains the word love. This art piece isn't out to make an overtly political statement on capital punishment. Like all good art, this project organizes elements in the world around it to help an audience see and feel in a new way. The difference is that the world Kazemi's commenting on isn't the physical world, not really. It's the digital world, the world of the internet. And indeed, much of our digital internet art is focused on itself, on the visible and, more importantly, invisible aspects of a network that's all around us. Computation is now everywhere. It is layered over everything, and we are living inside that computer as well. That's James Bridle, a critic and digital artist. Bridle did a project recently called Rainbow Planes, a project that started when he noticed some odd artifacts from Google Earth of planes with rainbow after images. It's a glitch, um, but like all true glitches, it's not just a mistake. Um, it's kind of an opportunity to look through into the underlying systems that produce this image. In this case, it shows us that the satellites composing these images aren't using cameras, but rather are collecting data from a broad swath of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they record red, green, and blue separately when they, when they make these data images. And so occasionally you find within satellite images these artifacts which are produced by fast-moving objects. Bridal's digital art wants to help us see the way technology sees us how hugely powerful systems have moved slowly into our lives without much protest. These systems are not like us. We see with eyes, they see with data. We think with minds, they think with algorithms. 
Art like this shows us that our increasing dependence on sophisticated technologies comes at the cost of substituting our values and our motives for theirs. So maybe the aesthetic value of internet art is measured by its ability to help us see the internet, just as a novel can help us see language or an image can help us see reality. That's just an idea, and I can't say how valid it is for you. But I think we do have to try to develop an aesthetic for this new digital art, a way by which we can determine which of it is good, which of it is crap, and which we consider truly essential. Because what we think is great art speaks ultimately to what we think is valuable in culture. And articulating our values about the internet, the global network, in the years before it consumes everything, might just be the most important thing our generation could ever do. <laughs> Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Getting this in just before sunset here. Welcome to 2016. If you want to help me out in 2016, you can pledge a dollar or three dollars per video by clicking right below here and going to my Patreon page. That money will go toward making 50 new videos for you guys this year, which is an exciting prospect to make what I hope is content unique to YouTube and the internet. Um, so thank you guys again. I will see you all next Wednesday.